say good evening, everyone. It's great to have you back at the, the course, and the fact that you are here tonight means that I haven't lost you in the first lecture, which is great, and so thank you for coming back. I trust that we'll have a good time tonight as we uh, join together and uh, look at the Bible, specifically how um, it was determined to have the number of books in the Bible that we have. As um, we start this evening, I would like to read from Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. And if you don't know where it is, that's the reason why you're here in this course, to find out where it is. But it's roughly in the middle, I, I would say a bit more uh, further than the middle of, of the Bible. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. <clears throat> for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is what the Lord said through Isaiah to the people of Israel at the time. Essentially, an invitation to come to the Lord and to find healing and restoration and forgiveness and, and all those wonderful things that we find God promising us if we repent and turn from our wicked ways. But there's an interesting uh, reference here in verse 11. And it says, just as the rain goes and accomplishes its purpose, and that is watering the earth and making seed grow and so on. Just in the same way, when my word goes out, it doesn't return to me empty. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that the word of God is sharper even than a sword. And John, when he writes a revelation towards the end of a revelation, in fact the last few verses, uh, says in chapter 22, verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, and obviously referring to the book that he just wrote. That's the book of Revelation. But I personally firmly believe that it refers to more than just the book of Revelation. It essentially, in my personal belief, refers to all of Scripture. And it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The word of God is powerful. The word of God can penetrate a heart and a mind and a person who is totally... Uh, oblivious to God. It can penetrate the heart of even the wildest enemy of God and, and God's kingdom. And the word of God spoken into a situation according to God's promise will not return to him empty. And I have seen that in my own life again and again. Uh, just reading scripture, just absorbing it and how it changes me on an ongoing basis. And this is my challenge to you as we, as we learn more about the word of God that you will allow the Word of God to penetrate your heart and your soul so that you can be changed, so that we can be changed, and so that we can become more like Him and then also become more effective as we live for Him uh, in this world. So let's pray together uh, as we start. Father, we thank You for this opportunity as we come together, as we learn more about You and about Your Word, and tonight, very specifically, as we learn more about the Bible and how it was put together, so that we, today, can still benefit from your word and your words that go out into this world and also reaches us, uh, reach us as, as it changes us uh, from the inside out. 
And this is my prayer, Lord, that we would uh, learn more about you, that we would learn to appreciate you more, and that we will learn to appreciate your word, your Bible, more as we get to know it. Lord, I pray for your guidance and your leading tonight as we share together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me take you uh, back to last week and every week as we come together, just a very brief a review or revision of where we have been in the previous week. We have looked at the term Bible, the, the, the word, the name Bible. We have also discussed the reliability of the Bible. I've tried to uh, prove to you uh, in some factual, objective way um, that the Bible is a very, very special book. I don't think anybody can uh, deny that. Whether people believe it is another thing. But we also looked at some of our subjective beliefs about uh, the Bible. And then we also looked at the fact that the Bible does make a difference um, in our lives and it, it continues to do so. We also noted that there are different genres, literature types in the Bible. Uh, there are 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old and 27 in the New uh, Testaments. And uh, we have looked at how the Bible is made up of different uh, forms and, and literature uh, uh, genres. Now, I wonder whether you would be able, if I ask you tonight, be able to answer this question. And I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up or, or answer that, but where do we get the name Bible? Does anybody remember? Biblos um, is a Greek word which developed and was used by, um, uh, by uh, the Latin language, Biblia. Uh, essentially Biblia or Tab Biblia Tahagia, which means the books, the holy ones or the holy books. Um, and even, eventually the term uh, evolved and became our word that we use for the Bible. And uh, in, in many different languages, you can still recognize that particular name. Uh, in many of the South African languages, something about Bible or Bibla or Babel or whatever, you, you can almost recognize that name in many languages. Why do we refer to an Old Testament? In fact, when you talk to a Jew today, a proper committed Jew, uh, he would probably be um, offended by the word Old Testament because for them it's not old. But do you remember the story? And uh, since we have a New Testament, which is what Jesus came to do, a new covenant, and that's what the word testament really means, uh, it, it refers to the fact that there was an old covenant, the way that God used to work, but then when Jesus came, he fulfilled the Old Testament or the old covenant, the old way in which God worked, and he completed what God planned, and he completed the work of God. And that work will finally be uh, completed when Jesus comes back at the second coming. I've already given you the answer to the next question. How many books in the Old Testament? 39 and 27 in the New and then can you describe some of the Bible genres from both the Old and the New Testament? Essentially, there are four. Four of them in the Old and four of them in the New, ranging from Pentateuch, historical books, wisdom books, and prophetic books in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have the gospel literature genre. Uh, we have a historical book with a bit of preaching in the book of Acts. Then we have letters or epistles. And then we have the book of Revelation. Uh, right at the end. And those represent broad genres with all sorts of different things uh, in between and sub-genres and so on and so on. Right, now we have an opportunity uh, to check in a little bit. Last week I told you, you're going to do some memorization and um, I do challenge you, just turn your, your uh, notes around. There's an empty page at the back and uh, see if you can write down the first 10 books uh, of the Old Testament in sequence. And it's got to be in sequence. And don't cheat and don't look at your Bible. <laughs> I'll give you a minute to complete that. And then um, please feel free to use uh, abbreviations as well. Like G-E-N for Genesis. Oops, I've just given you the first one. <laughs> if you look at your notes again, you will find Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and we'll stop there for tonight. There's a, there's a good sequence here, and I, I want to try and get you into that sequence uh, from the early days on. Next week, I'll try and fill in uh, the gaps in terms of the history of Israel. 
But when you look at the book of Genesis as it is on the screen, um, you really have the story of beginnings. And when we get to the second module, we'll expand on the meaning and the contents of the book of Genesis. But you have the beginnings. It's the beginning of the world and the universe as God created it. It's the beginning of the nation of Israel when God called Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, and it's also the beginning of the nation of, of Israel going to Egypt. And that's where we, that's where we leave the story uh, of Genesis. Exodus tells us of the exodus from Egypt as they prepare to go all the way to the promised land. Now, all the way over to Joshua, and it's only by the time of Joshua that you find the people actually moving into the land of Israel. So, in between Exodus and Joshua, which is a historical timeline, uh, we have the consolidation of the nation under God. They're stopping at Sinai, receiving the law, um, and that is described for us in the books of Leviticus and Numbers. And then when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, as we'll see much later, it means a second statement of the law or a repeat of the law. Deutero means second and uh, nomos means law. So it's a second statement of the law. And Deuteronomy is actually a summary of the first four books uh, in, to a large extent. Then when you get to the book of Joshua, you're now ready to go into the land uh, of uh, Canaan, into the promised land. And so there you have uh, a bit of a historical sequence. So when you memorize these books, try and remember a little bit of the history as it unfolds. It gets a lot more difficult when we hit the, the Psalms and Proverbs, and then when we get to the prophets, uh, it's very difficult to memorize them in historical sequence because there is no historical sequence. But at least the first half of the Old Testament would be relatively easy to memorize in this particular way. Now, um, check your work or find someone else to do it for you. Um, I hope that you have done well, and if you did, well, well done. And by the end of this module, you will know all the names of all 66 books uh, in the Bible if you, if you stay with me. And I want to challenge you and encourage you, actually, to uh, continue to memorize the books of the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, eventually. Brings us to uh, where we are today in our lecture time together, uh, the canon of the Bible. Why do we have these 66 books uh, in the Bible? Now, before I get into the lecture uh, properly, uh, once again, just to remind you of the Bible Atlas, there's also the bigger one called Biblica. Um, they are available in the bookshop uh, and in bookshops uh, anywhere. Biblica you can get from us. And then the two textbooks that I'm using, uh, which gives introductory comments about what I am teaching in the first module only. They really will cover the first three modules, uh, and you only really need one of them, uh, or any other book that is similar to this. And this is really to encourage you to read further and wider than what I am able to cover, cover in our uh, uh, two hours together. The one book that I didn't bring uh, at the previous lecture was um, the Bible Dictionary. Uh, it's called the IVP New Bible Dictionary. It's been around for many years. It's been updated a few times. It's really is a standard work and very, very reliable. Uh, somewhere a cross between Bible study and academic uh, work. It's probably a little bit more of an academic approach, but it provides you information about anything and anybody in the Bible that you would like to know about, whether it's a city that you uh, want to look up or anything about a Bible book. And most of the things that I share with you here in this course uh, will be listed and described and discussed in uh, a book such as the New Bible Dictionary. And as I said to you last time, these are also not this particular book, but similar approaches to this are available either online or in software packages. So if you operate uh, more with uh, computers and software, then that would be a better option to go for something like that. Uh, in fact, it does a far quicker search for you than what you would be able to do with a physical uh, printed book. However, it is one of those books that you put on your shelf, uh, the New Bible Dictionary. It's a reference work. You don't read it at night uh, when you go to sleep. You will go to sleep uh, if you read it at night. Uh, so maybe it's a good one to buy. Um, but it's one of those you leave on your shelf and you, you, you want to know something about some topic and you go to the New Bible Dictionary and it will give you that information. So back to the canon um, of the Bible. The issue that we are discussing tonight is 
who wrote the Bible. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer to all of that, really, uh, because in the second and third modules, we'll go book by book. And as I pointed out last week, uh, we have more than or about or roughly 40 different authors who wrote the different books that we have in the Bible. And so I'm not going to give you the answer to that particular question except to say uh, that ultimately, from a human perspective, about 40 different human people wrote the Bible over a long period of time. Then how many books have absolute authority? Um, maybe you've wondered about that, and where does the Bible get that authority? Or at least, why do people say that the Bible has this kind of authority? And then, why only these books? Now, I, uh, I don't know whether this comes as a shock to your system as I was growing up. Obviously, um, I was introduced to the Bible and Bible studies and reading the Bible myself. Uh, at, at one stage, I didn't even know about other books that were written so many, many years ago. And so, oftentimes, as people grow up, especially in a Christian environment, they may be shocked to find out that there are actually other books. In fact, there are Christian traditions who accept some of the other books that haven't made it into what we refer to as the Protestant uh, Bible. So, why only these? And then, uh, if, if we answer that question, uh, who, who were those people who decided? Now, again... I'm not going to give you chapter and verse and name on that, but we will discuss uh, that particular question. How was this decided, uh, if we can at least, if we can determine it at all? And then what procedure was followed to approve or to decide on these books? And um, these are the questions that we're going to uh, discuss tonight, and I'm, I'm sure I may raise more questions than I'm able to answer, uh, but feel free to engage more. Please read more about these things. Just today, I was on the internet once again and just looked up some of the uh, detail and background, and uh, the information is, is overwhelming. In fact, um, you will even find the different views when you go and read up um, on the internet. Uh, just uh, again, that word of caution, that you don't always know what the source is of whoever posted something on the internet. So, Bible canon, what is it? Uh, is it a camera, or is it perhaps a dangerous weapon? Well, uh, it's neither a camera, nor, it, nor is it a, a weapon. In terms of our prescribed reading, as we, um, and, and I encourage you to go and, and read some of this, either in the prescribed books or others, but in Johnston, in the copy that I have, um, on pages 9 to 13, there is a discussion about that. And then in Harris, the red book that I'm using on pages 50, uh, 35 to 53, also a discussion on this very same topic. However, as I said to you last time, every one of these topics uh, is actually a study on its own. And people who have done the research and published on this uh, have published um, hundreds of books on this particular topic. And so uh, there, there's no lack of reading material when it comes to a topic like the canon of the Bible. If you want to uh, follow this in, in your New Bible Dictionary and read more about what the New Bible Dictionary is saying, or a similar dictionary, then the canon of the Old Testament, the canon of the New Testament, um, apocrypha, pseudepigrapha, um, these are not swear words, I'll explain them uh, a little bit later on, uh, a topic such as the language of the Old Testament or the language of the New Testament. Those are uh, relevant topics for, topics for what we are discussing uh, in our lecture time tonight. So by way of introduction, the books in our Bible were written by uh, many authors over uh, roughly a period of 14 to 1500 years. And the Bible contains 66 books which were collected and finalized, and that is agreed upon some consensus was reached over even a longer period of time, probably uh, from the first time that anything was written down all the way to the time that we in history and church history can determine that there was uh, consensus, general consensus. We're talking about an 1800-year period, um, roughly. Many books, many other documents were written during the same time, some of them dating to the time of the Old Testament, maybe not as old, but certainly in the few hundred years before Christ. Many of these documents saw the light, and they were around by the time Jesus uh, was born and when Jesus ministered on earth. And then even more of those kinds of documents were written during the, the New Testament phase, especially in the 2nd and 3rd centuries A.D. There was a proliferation of, of 
we can't call it publication because publication wasn't yet a, a known word, but written material that's, that's, that saw the light. As more and more people started writing some of their ideas or history or their impression of Jesus uh, and the early apostles. And, and that leaves the question, it begs the question, uh, who decided and why was it decided that these 66 books will enter into our Bible? And some church traditions, as I said before, uh, actually ascribe uh, value and sometimes even authority to more than the 66 books uh, that we have in our canon. The concept canon, um, back to the camera and the, and the canon, uh, the shooting thing, the word canon actually comes from a Latinized Greek word, kanon, uh, and that is a little bit of Greek that you find there on the screen. I'm not sure whether it's printed out in your notes, uh, but it, that's the way you pronounce it, kanon or kanon, with the emphasis on that last uh, syllable. It's a Greek word um, that refers to a reed or a stalk of papyrus, uh, which was common in, in the ancient world around the Middle East, and it was used as a measuring stick or a, a yardstick or a rod, uh, pretty much like we use a ruler today to measure, a tape measure to measure distance. And it was like a yardstick. And so you can very easily see how this particular concept ultimately developed or evolved into something that meant a, a, a yardstick or a measuring stick, how do we measure which of the books should come into the Bible? It, it's not limited to the Bible, but by and large, it's a word that refers to, and if people talk about uh, the canon of scriptures, then the first picture that pops into your mind is probably the books of the Bible or the canon of the Bible. The use of the word went through many, many stages, but it is now a technical term to refer to those accepted and authentic books that we have in the Bible. Um, if you have a, a Roman Catholic background, you will also know that the word is used when a particular person, like it's happening now with uh, uh, Pope John II, uh, Paul II, um, and, and he is in the process of being canonized. In other words, to be declared a saint. So if you, if you, if you use this word in a Roman Catholic environment, you would have to explain what you mean by that because in that environment it, it has a double meaning. It can refer to the canon of scriptures, but it can also refer to a person being canonized. Bible canonization was not a predetermined process, and I need to make this very, very clear from the beginning. We're not talking about someone sitting down and deciding, okay, the job today is to go and find all the books in the Bible and make sure that the right books enter into the Bible. For, for that, the, the, the proof for that is the fact that it took hundreds and hundreds of years for this process to be finalized. And even then, we're not really talking about one final single moment where everybody in the whole world said, okay, let's take a vote or anything like that. It's also not a process that dropped out of heaven. And I need to, and maybe that's a shock to your system, uh, but it is a process that can be followed uh, in, in church and Jewish history and to, to actually try and determine how people over a long period of time came to use these different documents and gave them um, the sense of authority. And obviously behind all of that we see the working of God through His Holy Spirit as He guided that. But it wasn't a revelation in one single moment to anybody. It was a process that was followed and that I need to state up front, because as we go through, and very briefly, I'll, I'll share with you how this process de uh, evolved or developed. Um, it was guided by God, but it was certainly a long process that was followed to determine that. By way of a quick overview, as we, um, as we look at, at the process of canonization, during the same time that the Bible was written, I said this before, uh, starting roughly 1400 BC uh, all the way up to about 100 AD, other books also came into existence, dating mostly from the last centuries B.C. and then the first few centuries A.D., our time. They are referred to as Apocrypha or Pseudepigrapha. And in a moment, I'll try and point out the difference between the two. And they were in circulation among the Jews by the time that Jesus uh, was here and the early church got started. Both the Jews, as well as the early church, gradually came to some understanding of which of the books belong 
uh, to the authentic Word of God or the Holy Scriptures. A few definitions before we go on. The word canonization, spelled either with a Z or an S. Uh, I'm not personally exactly sure whether it should be an S or, an, or a Z. Most of the times the Z is more an American uh, spelling, but um, the computer accepts both, it seems like. Uh, the process, the canonization is the process of determining the canon or the approval of the books of the Bible. Now, it's not something we do anymore. The process is essentially complete because we don't determine that anymore. We have what we believe to be the complete Bible and the Word of God. So we don't, we don't fiddle with that process anymore. But we refer to that in the past as the process of canonization. The word apocrypha refers to those books that were written that are of great value and were debated by different either Jewish or Christian traditions as to whether they should be in or out of the canon. And they have great value in terms of reading them from a purely Protestant point of view, which is where I'm coming from, uh, and also a conservative evangelical point of view. Uh, in my personal opinion, they are not canonized, they're not in the Bible, and therefore I would not ascribe the same authority to them that I ascribe to what we have in the Bible. That is not shared by all the Christian traditions around the world, however. The word pseudepigrapha uh, is made up of two different words. The one is pseudo, uh, which is a Greek word that means to lie or to be false. And grapha, uh, you can almost figure out, it means a writing. And so what it really refers to is a book written in the name of another person. Now let me give you a quick example. If it talks about, um, if, if I publish a book today and I call it uh, the, um, the Travels of Adolf Hitler, and I write it as if I am Adolf, Adolf Hitler. I'm writing under his name, and I'm obviously not writing as Hitler. Or you can pick and choose. And the reality is that especially in the first couple of centuries uh, in the New Testament era, many such books saw the light. Um, the letters of Jeremiah, um, the, not the travels, but... Uh, the story of Moses and all sorts of, but they were written actually about 200 or 300 years uh, after Jesus was born. And so they clearly written as if Moses is speaking, but he is obviously not publishing or writing that particular book. And I shouldn't even use the word publish because it wasn't known at the time. The, term, the terms apocrypha and pseudepigrapha are often wrongly uh, used interchangeably. I'm saying wrongly, uh, and I understand why people do it, because these are all the, and it's another word that we sometimes use, the extra-biblical books, uh, sometimes called deuterocanonical. In other words, they are second canon type books. They're not part of the primary canon, but secondary uh, canonical books. Uh, but the difference between Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha is, when it comes to the Apocrypha, they have been debated, both by Jews as well as by the early Christian church as to whether they should be in or out of the, the Bible canon. That is not the case with the pseudepigrapha. And if you, and, and by the way, you can go online and, and I have given you some more information. We'll talk more about some of these books uh, in, in, um, later on tonight. But some of those books are absolutely clear. There's not even an issue whether they are pseudepigrapha, in other words, written in someone else's name. They are oftentimes wild, they're fairy tales, they have all sorts of different stories that are just, even at a cursory reading, they're not authentic. And so the church and the Jews never even debated that issue, and they are called pseudepigrapha books. We also refer to those books, as I said, as extra-biblical, extra-canonical, or even deuterocanonical uh, books. <coughs> In terms of the value of the extra biblical books, so uh, some people would say, well, are you trying to hide them from us? I mean, why don't preachers preach from them or preach about them? Well, I think, number one, because many of us preachers just don't know all the facts about it. Um, and secondly, it, they, they do not provide us with authentic biblical material to use in the pulpit to preach from. You can use them as illustrations or to refer to them by way of illustration, but they do not make the kind of text material 
that you use to preach authentically uh, the Word of God or the message of God from a pulpit. But there's nothing secret about these books. They are available, they have been published, they, they have been uh, translated into English and other languages, and they are there for anybody to buy and to read them. Um, I guess part of the difficulty is it takes us such a long time to even work our way through the Bible, let alone all the other books. And I can tell you, you put them all together, you will have more material in the other books than you actually have in the Bible itself. And so to try and work your way through all of them is going to be quite a massive a mammoth task. And I haven't done it, uh, just to be very honest about it. I have never read through all of the Apocrypha. But the Apocrypha contains some valuable However, non-inspired information. And, and one of those examples is the book of 1st Maccabees. And I will give you more information about that. And you also have a handout that will go along with that. The book of 1st Maccabees actually provides us with the information that I will use two weeks from now and two lectures from now when we talk about the intertestamental period. If it wasn't for 1st Maccabees, our knowledge of a particular stage or an era in Jewish history would have been gone, would have been missed or missing uh, in, in our knowledge. But it provides us with that sort of background and information as to what happened during that particular time in the land of Palestine and more particularly with the Jews. However, it's not the case with most of the Apocrypha don't provide us any historical information, really. In fact, the book 2 Maccabees is non-historical, really, and is, is of very little value when it comes to helping us understand the biblical uh, background and, and, um, and the biblical history. It provides us something of a, a thought pattern, perhaps, in the 200 years or so before Christ, but that's about it in terms of the value of, let's say, a book like 2 Maccabees. By and large... The pseudepigrapha are books with non-authentic information, fables, visions, uh, mostly visions and mostly dreamt up stories uh, about either the life of Jesus or the life of one of the apostles. And as I said, even a cursory reading uh, of that, and when you compare it with the information that we have in the Bible, will clearly prove or show to you uh, that these books are non-authentic and they were never considered for inclusion uh, in the Bible. Some of you may wonder about the chapter and verse divisions. Um, you may have heard a preacher say uh, at some stage, uh, do remember that the, the Bible was not written with chapters and verses, and that is actually true. These books were written on scrolls uh, at the time and kept in scrolls, and it was just one long sentence. In fact, most of the, um, of the Greek manuscripts that we have from the New Testament were written in, in Greek with no breaks in between the words even. Uh, and seldom do you even have a paragraph. So you just have these long columns of writing uh, of the Greek uh, language. And so there, there were no chapter divisions. And uh, in, in the Old Testament, you can imagine you're in the scroll of Isaiah. And we know that it wasn't a scroll because Jesus went to the synagogue in Capernaum and he was handed the scroll of Isaiah. So the, the Old Testament was written and then kept and copied on scrolls and then kept somewhere in a little room at the back where it was in safekeeping so that nobody else could put their hands uh, on the holy books of, 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 the, of, the, of God. And um, so that scroll of Isaiah was, was given to Jesus. And then it was written on sort of uh, paragraphs or call them the equivalent of a page, but rolled up. So you can imagine how difficult it must have been to find a place now, tonight, I was able to read from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, and I highlighted that. That was not a privilege that people for thousands of years had. It was only much later that those were divided. And here is a quote from Bible, the Bible Society, uh, .ca, Canada. The Bible was divided into chapters by Stephen Langton, who later became Archbishop Bishop of Canterbury. Early in the 1200s, that's our era, that's 800 years ago, Robert Stephanus, a book printer from Paris, is credited with dividing those chapters into verses in 1551. The first complete printed Bible using the chapter and verse division, divisions was the Geneva Bible of 1560. So we're talking about the last five, 450 or 500 years that the Bible was actually divided into chapters and verses. And so those things are not inspired. We believe the words in our Bible were inspired, but certainly not the chapters and the verse uh, divisions. Going back to the Old Testament, 
uh, and starting with the Old Testament actually, uh, what, what was this process that was followed with the canon or the canonization uh, of the Old Testament? How the 39 Old Testament books entered into the Bible. First of all, just a word about the language of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in the language called Hebrew. Hebrew, you find in 98, 99% of the Old Testament. There are a couple of exceptions. The books of Daniel and Ezra have certain sections or chapters that were written in a related language, Aramaic. And just to remind you that by the time Jesus came and lived in Palestine, he spoke Aramaic. That was his home language. Aramaic evolved, uh, developed out of Hebrew, uh, and over many, many years, there's also a modern history to that. Uh, it was um, a few hundred years ago that Jews really started reviving the, the Hebrew language of the Old Testament once again. It, it, de- it developed into all sorts of different branches as the Jews scattered around the world over the hundreds of years, even in our era. But over the last few hundred years, they started a process of reviving the Old Testament language again. And so what you see today in Israel is the exact same script, and many of the words are exactly the same, the same grammar that you find in the Old Testament Hebrew as well. Both Hebrew and Aramaic are Semitic languages from the Northwest Semitic group, along with Eucharist, uh, the Canaanite, Phoenician languages, and a few others in that area. Uh, It's pretty much like uh, um, uh, people perhaps moving from Afrikaans to Dutch or uh, with a particular local expressions and so on. And as as people moved around, they they developed the language or the the language developed in different branches. And so is Hebrew and Aramaic and the other Semitic languages mentioned. Hebrew has 22 characters, consonantal, uh, consonantal characters, and they're written from right to left. Early manuscripts, uh, just like modern Hebrew, contained no vowels. If you go to Israel today, uh, and I do want to encourage you to think about a visit to Israel, it is really worth it. It brings the Bible alive. It, it connects some of the places and, and the experiences that you read about in the Bible with real life. And so I do want to encourage you to look at that as, as an option. But when you go to Israel, modern-day Israel, you will find the language, and even if you pick up a, a newspaper, it's written with no vowels whatsoever. Uh, it only has consonants. And so it would look like something like this. I want to ask you to read this. School. Not that difficult, is it? I left out the vowels. It's just a little bit more difficult when I say to you... Um, What is that? <laughs> you lost, and so am I. Uh, okay, I, I don't actually know, but let's say Peter's, no, or uh, whatever, Paul, or uh, whatever. School is cool. <laughs> but it can also be coal, C O A L. And so it makes it rather difficult, doesn't it? Now, um, Hebrew is written from right to left, as I said. See if you can figure this one out. Anybody seen that before? Okay, this is a sh, and a l, and a m. Shalom, yes, good. Now, what happened is, and I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you in a moment, but the Masoretes who lived hundreds of years later, they went through a process of vocalization. They designed vowels to make it easier for people to read the Bible. Up to that point in time, once you you know Hebrew, it's actually not that difficult. Now, I don't read Hebrew fluently, but what happened is below and above, they started adding. So that is an ah sound below the line. And this is an or sound above the line. And so that made it easier to read the Hebrew, Shalom. Um, but if you're a proper Jew, or even an Israeli today, you don't, read the, you don't need the vowels in order to read your language, because they just add 
um, and there are all sorts of grammar and rules uh, that determine uh, all of that. The uh, Masoretic text is the most common Hebrew Bible used by both the Jews and the Christians. And what happened is these Masoretes were Jewish scribes who decided that they're going to start adding the vowels to make absolutely 100% sure that when you start copying, and we'll talk more about copying in another lecture, when you start copying, and especially hand copying, because that's all they did, that, that, that they could determine the process and determine the actual pronunciation uh, and the vowel that needs to go with, with those. And there are just a few little cases where the difference could be between uh, coal and cool. Uh, and there are such cases in the Hebrew Bible where you have to think hard and you can go both directions uh, in terms of uh, the Hebrew language. The Masoretic text, and here is uh, some of the, the background from Wikipedia, uh, it's also referred to as the MT by way of abbreviation, is the authoritative Hebrew text of the Jewish Bible regarded almost universally as the official version of the Tanakh. Remember Tanakh? Um, and I'll, I'll remind you in a moment about that as well. It defines not just the books of the Jewish canon, but also the precise letter text of the biblical books in Judaism, as well as their vocalization and accentuation known as the Masora. The MT, the Masoretic text, is also widely used as the basis for translations of the Old Testament in Protestant Bibles, and in recent years, since 1943, also the Roman Catholic Bibles. In modern times, the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown the Masoretic text to be nearly identical to some text of the Tanakh dating from about 200 BCE. I would uh, be more conservative and say probably um, about 100 or so, at least 100 be uh, years before Christ. Now, more about that particular story in another lecture, but just uh, very briefly, all the Hebrew manuscripts that we had available to the church up to 1947, as I said last, last week, all of those dated from about 900. In fact, the oldest of those is 900 AD. When in 1947 and beyond the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it took the process back by a thousand years. And what this quote is saying, uh, which can be proved scientifically, is that the, the Hebrew text of 1000 AD and what was found uh, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls are virtually the exact same thing. Now, that's an amazing process. And you, 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 can't, you can't deny the fact that God somehow was behind all of that and protecting that uh, process. The Jewish scriptures um, use a different division and a book count to that of the Old Testament that is familiar to us. I, I said this to you last week, they, they don't have 39 books. They actually have 24 books in the Jewish Bible or the Jewish scriptures. And it's divided into those three sections that we looked at last week, also where we get the word Tanakh from. Um, it's, it's the Torah, which is Genesis, Le Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then the Nevi'im, which is the, the prophets, uh, or Nevi'im, or Nevi'im, whichever way you want to pronounce it or spell it. Um, and that is Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the twelve. If you count that, you don't count twelve, you only count one scroll, because this is how they were written on scrolls. So there were 24 different scrolls, and the last twelve prophets were all written on one single scroll, and therefore the, the Jews refer to, them, to, their, uh, uh, to that particular book as one, one single book or one scroll. And then you have the Ketuvim, uh, which is the writings uh, or the wisdom literature, that Psalms, Proverbs, Job, uh, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, which we, with Chronicles, normally list with the historical books. They list them with the wisdom literature. So those are the three breakdown divisions in the Hebrew Tanakh or the Hebrew Scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures, although the number of the books in the Hebrew canon uh, differs from the Old Testament that we know, there is actually no difference between the Jewish scriptures and our Old Testament. Absolutely nothing. Um, it is exactly the same. The Jews went through their own process of canonization. The history in, in this regard is not clear. It's never been written up. 
uh, is not as if people, as I said earlier on, sat down on one day and said, uh, number one, let's do a canonization process. And number two, let's write it all down so that the generations to come will know all about it. Th they didn't have a process like that. Uh, they didn't know that they were actually doing it. They were simply going through a process which wasn't necessarily planned. It wasn't clinical, but it was a process nonetheless. By the time of the New Testament, the Old Testament scripture is known uh, to the Jews, to Jesus, and to the apostles. Uh, was probably in a similar form to what we know as the Old Testament uh, today. The early church simply accepted the Jewish scriptures as their Bible, if you wish, as the scriptures. And when Paul refers to the scriptures, he's referring to the Old Testament as we know it today and as the Jews used it at that particular time. Now, don't, do remember that at the time, even the time of Jesus, they were written on scrolls. So there was no one single book to pick up and say, we're going to find this or that passage. These things were oftentimes memorized because it's mostly an oral type community. It wasn't as if the, the normal person in the street wrote down all sorts of books and had volumes of libraries. Libraries were there. Um, uh, synagogues had a whole library of, uh, of, this, of the scrolls. Uh, all of those 24 books uh, in the Hebrew Bible would have been in just about every synagogue. And then probably other books were also kept there. And um, through archaeological means, they have discovered plenty of different libraries in different parts of the world. So the ancient world knew about books and keeping them and keeping them safe in libraries. And some wealthy individuals would have a little bit of a library. But the average person in the street would not have any library or many books. So they had to go to the synagogue in order to hear the word of God being read and preached or explained. The process of Old Testament canonization, um, the scholars agree that the process of canonization of the Old Testament is not an easy one to determine. Now later on in your notes, right at the end of the notes, you will see a book that I'm using um, by Hill and Walton on the Old Testament. And um, they uh, list a certain process that was probably followed um, in determining the Old Testament. It was a long process. It was essentially completed by the New Testament times, but not in any official way, such as a final committee or um, the Sanhedrin, you know, sitting one day and saying, uh, this is it and no more. The idea of inspired and authentic books was one that grew over time. It didn't come necessarily initially, although initially there would have been a very clear understanding when God spoke to Moses and Moses wrote certain things down there would be a very clear understanding that this is God's word. And therefore the Jews would die for, initially, especially for the Torah. When the wisdom literature, the Psalms and the prophets and those, when they started writing and speaking, it probably took a little bit longer to give the same kind of authority to that. But over the years, and remember we're talking about um, a thousand year long period, over those years uh, this process became uh, complete. And it reached a point where both Jews and Christians agreed on those uh, 24 in the Jewish canon and 39 in the Christian canon that those books are the authentic words uh, uh, and word of God. In terms of stages described uh, in Hill and Walton, and as I said, I list the book at the end of your notes so that you uh, know where I, where I get this information. Uh, the process probably started with the authoritative utterances, such as the oral stage, that is when people, uh, like Moses, said, I heard God speak to me, I'm, I'm passing on God's word to you. You read through the book of Deuteronomy, and Moses says again and again and again, God spoke to me, this is the word of God, these are the precepts of God, or the commandments of God, you must obey it. Uh, he speaks to them again and again, before they go into the land of Canaan, that they must do that. And so, the, the way that Moses must have spoken to them, as is, is evidence in Deuteronomy, is, is a, uh, gives, it, gives the impression that he spoke authoritatively as representing God. There were more. The prophets, on an ongoing basis, would, would use the introductory formula, hear the word of the Lord, or oftentimes it's written, the word of the Lord came to so-and-so. Uh, you see that particular formula in the Old Testament on a regular basis. But then, of course, there was formal written uh, documents such as uh, written by Moses on Mount Sinai. We, we know that he wrote at least some uh, of that. Uh, Jeremiah, we have evidence that Jeremiah wrote 
and other prophets as well, uh, because these things were written down. In fact, Jeremiah tells us that he wrote, he even had a scribe. At one stage, what he wrote was burned up, and he wrote it once again, and then uh, hid it uh, from, the, from the reigning king, king at that particular time. Uh, that story is told in the book of Jeremiah. And then those documents were collected over time. <laughs> A lengthy process probably, a very comprehensive process, taking more than a thousand years as I said before, but ultimately through a process of collecting, these documents became more and more authentic in the minds of the people. And then sorting through those documents and fixing a canon. How and when this actually happened we will never know. We do know uh, some of the, the history of the New Testament era in this regard, which I will point out uh, probably uh, after we've taken a break. But in terms of the Old Testament, that particular process is no, never described, nowhere described, so we cannot go and research that anymore. Some of the criteria, how did they determine, how did the Jews, the Jewish scholars, how did they determine over time that these books uh, and what we have in our Old Testament should be included? Inherent divine inspiration was probably something they looked for. In other words, is God speaking through these words? And as they have read it again and again over hundreds of years, that conviction came to them. This is God's voice. Now, that's not, again, something that dropped out of heaven. It's not a golden tablet or anything. This is something that became a conviction. God is speaking. Some is direct. Uh, we know that sometimes God spoke audibly to people. Uh, it's not an experience that we, we share anymore in our day and time. Uh, but we know that in biblical times, God sometimes spoke audibly, sometimes through an angel appearing, and sometimes maybe a vision or whatever it was. But surely we have those evidences in the Old Testament of God speaking in a more direct way. In other cases, it was a person responding to a particular situation. Uh, a prophet being called by God. He sees the evil in the society. He addresses that evil given the fact that the law tells them how they should live. Speaking into that situation. And that became authentic word written down and it was kept for generations to come. So divine inspiration was a very important one. Authorship. This was a more difficult one. But probably mostly based on the fact that the author had a position of leadership. Uh, it needed to be a prophet a king, a priest, a judge, or someone like that. Some, some leader in the community who was then speaking. And, and by the way, it's not all of the above, but a combination of these that probably determine w whether a book should be in the Bible or not. Then the content of the book, evaluating against the unity and the theme of the message of the overall revelation and the acts of God. There are certain books, and even if you read them, as I said before, they, they very evidently not supporting the general message of the Bible. They go contrary. They're not anti-God, but they, they just go contrary to the, the soul uh, of the Bible, as it were. And so that probably was also uh, one of the criteria. And then the usage by the nation. Simply by using it over time and seeing the impact that those words and the word made on them uh, was an important uh, way of determining whether these books should be included in the Bible. Some of the debates around the Old Testament canon, as I said to you, the process was not simply voted and everybody agreed. There, there was difference of opinion. There are a few books in the Old Testament that found it difficult to actually enter into the canon, uh, as it were. Uh, later rabbinical uh, and Christian debates center around two major issues. That's the inclusion of a few canonical books. Uh, Esther. When you read through the book of Esther as it is in our Bible today, it does not contain the word or the name of God at all. It never refers to God, Lord, Yahweh, or any, anything like that. And so obviously some early Jews would sort of balk at that and say, but how can you have a book in the Bible that it never even uses the, the name God? And so there was a debate around that and, and more about that a little bit later on. And then also the, uh, the Proverbs for some of the Jews, uh, really was a little bit too, uh, the book of the Proverbs, too, too earthly. Uh, again, it, it, it doesn't help us to be spiritual. It, it really just tells us how, how we behave uh, in a wise way. And so there was a debate around that. And then the Song of Songs, uh, if you have ever read through the Song of Songs, you will know why that debate was there. For many of them, it was just too erotic, it was too human. In fact, the very interpretation of the Song of Songs then became more spiritual, and that is, it describes the relationship between God and Israel. Uh, 
uh, and not between a, a man and a wife. Uh, if you want to know my interpretation on that, you need to come to the second module and then we'll talk about that as well. And then, of course, the other major debate, these are canonical books, but the other part of that debate over time was uh, the inclusion of the Apocrypha. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that and I'll give you some more information uh, about that as we go along. Just about the Old Testament Apocrypha, it comes from the Greek word uh, apokrafu, or apokrufa rather, uh, meaning those having been hidden away. And they are texts of uncertain authenticity or writings where the authorship is questioned. When used in the specific context of Judeo-Christian theology, the term apocrypha refers to any collection of scriptural texts that, fall, that falls outside the canon. Given that different denominations have different ideas about what constitutes, constitutes canonical scripture, there are several different versions uh, of the uh, Apocrypha. We're going to take a break and then we'll talk more about the Apocrypha uh, after the break. The books of the Apocrypha. Um, they were seen as, as hidden and that's really what the word Apocrypha means. Um, either... Um, they were seen as hidden by, uh, from, uh, by God, and therefore they contain hidden messages, or they were seen as, as hidden from the people, and therefore we need to put them aside, and um, other people shouldn't uh, see them, uh, in other words, to hide them from people. The number and the list of different apocrypha vary according to the tradition or the Bible version uh, that you may pick up. Um, there is the Septuagint, and I'll talk more about the Septuagint later on um, in, in our module, but the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, some hundred years, a few hundred years before Christ. Um, and the Septuagint included the Apocrypha, whereas the Hebrew version did not include the Apocrypha. And then there is the Vulgate. Last week we talked a little bit about the Latin uh, translation of the whole Bible uh, done by Jerome. And also, interestingly enough, the old King James, the first copies of the King James Version that was done in the 1600s, the first English uh, or proper English uh, and official translation, that also included the Apocrypha but listed at the back of the Old Testament and not uh, in, in uh, or among uh, the rest of the uh, books. Um, a summary description of the list um, and the content, I, I'm just going to give you a summary of that. But you also have another document, and you can go online, and you can check that. Um, and, and by the way, the Apocrypha uh, have been translated uh, and posted online. So if you go to some of the websites, uh, you, can, you can simply Google Apocrypha, uh, and there are plenty of different websites where the actual text of the Apocrypha uh, have, has been uh, translated. The different books, some of them are described, some background given, and then also, depending on the background or the tradition that the, the author comes from, they will give it some kind of a rating as to how they feel one should can, or can use it. Um, from uh, BibleResearcher.com, um, here is a list of the Apocrypha. There is one Esdras, uh, which supplements the book of Ezra with some interesting tales uh, that it tells. Uh, Ezra uh, has also been... Um, Ezra is, is the person who came back from, uh, from the exile. He tells us the story uh, about the rebuilding of the temple of Jerusalem after the Babylonians destroyed it. And so here you have an addition to the book of Ezra. Then there is second Ezra or Ezra Apocalypse dating from about 100 AD. In other words, our era. It's a typical Jewish uh, apocalyptic book containing dialogues between Ezra and an angel. And when we talk about apocalyptic material, you'll find that that is one of the characteristics of apocalyptic material. Some, some angelic conversation or some vision where an angel comes and speaks to the person and reveals some information. And here is a typical example of that. And then there is Tobit. Uh, it's a romantic tale in Aramaic, dating from about 200 BC, telling the story of a Jewish family in captivity in Nineveh. Uh, I hope some of the cities and, and environment and geography will come, uh, become uh, a bit more known to you as we go along and as I tell you the story of the history of Israel starting next week. And then there's the book of Judith. It's a story dating from 150 BC uh, about a Jewish girl who saved her city from uh, the enemy's attack. There is the uh, additions to Esther. Uh, 
uh, again, as I said to you before, uh, Esther was debated at one stage as to whether Esther belongs in the canon or not because of the lack of the name of God. Now, that is not the case with the additions. There are at least 50 references in a very short little section to the name of God. And so it's probably an attempt to correct what went wrong in the book of Esther, uh, in this particular book, the additions to Esther. There's the wisdom of Solomon, presented as Discourses of Solomon by an Alexandrian Jew, written in Greek about 100 B.C., uh, and it's a book that contains some worthy materials, such as the Proverbs and so on, uh, some similar kinds of materials. And there is Ecclesiasticus, uh, also called the Wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, or simply referred to as Sirach, uh, dating from about 200 B.C., and, and it was written in Hebrew, and it contains Proverbs and wise sayings, uh, something similar to our Proverbs in the Bible we have the book of Baruch. It's a collection of sayings uh, presented as if it was written by a disciple of Jeremiah. Baruch is actually mentioned in the, in the book of, of Jeremiah as the scribe, the one who wrote down some of the things for Jeremiah. And so it dates from about 150 BC. And you can see it's, uh, and especially when we get to the second module and we talk about the dates of the different books, but he lives uh, at least uh, five, 600 years, or 500 years or so after Jeremiah, and that's when this person, maybe 450 years after Jeremiah. There's the epistle of Jeremiah, a short tract against idolatry, presented as if Jeremiah wrote this letter. It dates from about 200 BC. There is a song of three holy children, uh, the supposed prayers of Daniel's three friends when they were thrown into the furnace um, in, uh, in captivity, and it was designed to be added after Daniel chapter 3, verse 23. There's the story of Susanna. Uh, Daniel divinely gives the true facts about a woman falsely accused of, adul of adultery. Uh, it's, it's a story designed to, to, to show how good Daniel was in, um, in truth saying or, or, or telling the truth or discovering the truth. And then there is the, the book Bell and the Dragon. Two weird stories about Daniel exposing the priests of Bell, which was the god of Babylon. And another incident where Daniel conquers a live dragon, dating the book itself, dates from about 150 uh, B.C. There's the prayer of Manasseh. Uh, it's a psalm of repentance for Manasseh, who was carried into uh, captivity. So it's not the Manasseh, the tribe uh, in Israel, but another person. And then there is the first Maccabees. Um, I've mentioned this book already. It dates from about 100 B.C. and it provides us some wonderful information and history about the Jews uh, in the land of Canaan uh, or Palestine during the years 175 to 135 uh, BC. And then we have 2nd Maccabees, some fanciful and legendary additions to the events found in 1st Maccabees. It dates somewhere between 100 BC and 70 AD, so it's not, it's not sure exactly when uh, it was written. So those are uh, the, the Apocrypha. There could be maybe one or two that can be added depending uh, on the tradition, but, but this is sort of seen as, if you wish, an official list of the Apocrypha. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to go and read up more about the background and the contents uh, of these books. The Old Testament pseudepigrapha were books written under a false name or another person's name, and they are generally clearly fictional and wild in their descriptions, as I said before. And there is general consensus among both Jews and Christians and all traditions that they should not belong uh, in, in the biblical canon. Some of the examples include the books of Adam and Eve, the Apocalypse of Adam, the Testament of Moses, the Tales of the Patriarchs. Uh, in fact, when you go online and you see a list of those kind of books, most of these date from the Christian era and they don't uh, date from the Old Testament era. Uh, and I would encourage you to go to pseudepigrapha.com where you can actually read up on these books and uh, you can even click and read the books themselves. As I said, they have been, they have been translated and uploaded onto many uh, sites and they're available. All right, that's the Old Testament canon and it brings us to the New Testament canon. I hope you're not disappointed in the actual process. I, I can't give you facts and dates. We can only imagine 
what the Jews must have gone through. And we have their own testimony of how they have gone through the process of, of canonization. But even modern Jews are totally dependent on what I just described to you in terms of determining how their Bible was put together. And once again, to, to reiterate or to emphasize that the Old Testament scripture, the Old Testament is the exact same thing as the Old Testament or the, uh, the scriptures of the Jews uh, that they still use till today. All right, now that same uh, question about the New Testament. We have 27 books in the New Testament, and how did they enter into the New Testament? Well, first of all, just a word about the language of the New Testament. It's written in Greek in its entirety. There are a few scholars who would argue that perhaps Matthew was written in Aramaic and then translated into Greek, uh, but there is absolutely zero evidence for that, nothing whatsoever. So as far as we know, the whole of the New Testament was written in Greek. And um, all the evidence that we have uh, points in this particular uh, direction. It was written in what was then, or what became known as Koine Greek, which is a development out of classical Greek, uh, which is very typical of language. It develops over time. And um, it was a more common version or common form of Greek at the time. And there are some scholars who even prefer to refer to New Testament Greek because even in the New Testament, you may have vocabulary and some gram grammatical rules and so on that differ slightly even from the Koine Greek. But Koine Greek is a, is a further development from classical Greek and there are a few other developments. And just by the way, modern Greek is still written in exactly the same way with the alphabet. Uh, that the Greeks use. However, the pronunciation and some of the grammatical rules have dramatically changed. And so, uh, if you're able to read the New Testament Greek, you're not able to understand modern Greek. Uh, the, the, the transition would be easier because the, the alphabet is, is the same and some of the rules still remain the same. But it is very, very different from uh, uh, modern Greek. Greek was, um, at the time, the lingua franca, the common language of the day. I will tell you more about that in another two lectures time when we talk about the New Testament, the intertestamental period, the, the New Testament background. Uh, what happened in the world that uh, people like Paul and Peter and, and Matthew and Mark and others wrote in Greek, although they came from a Jewish, most of them came from a Jewish background, and they, they spoke Aramaic, and they were fluent in Aramaic, especially Peter and, and John uh, and those. Uh, Paul and Luke and others may have grown up in a different environment, and they may have been um, well-versed in Greek, uh, but not so with, with some of the others. In fact, we, have, we, we don't have any evidence that Jesus ever spoke Greek. Uh, he may have, but we, we're not sure about that. But he certainly spoke Aramaic as his home language. Now, more about that in another couple of lectures when we talk about that whole background. But by the middle of the first century, the church, the early church, really expanded. Uh, to remind you of the book of Acts, it, started all, it all started in Jerusalem. And even on the day of Pentecost, we have a list of Jews who came to Jerusalem who lived in other parts of the world. They lived in Egypt, they lived in Rome, they lived in Asia Minor, and everywhere else. And because Greek at the time was the common language, the common spoken language, most of those people knew how to speak Greek. And so, the, fairly early in the church's history, it spread. It spread to, uh, to Antioch and Syria, then all the way to Asia Minor. And by the end of the first century, Asia Minor was the focal point of, um, of, of the, the gospel and the Christian church. Uh, that is modern-day Turkey, by the way. In fact, for hundreds of years after that, until the Muslims came in, and swept across uh, the ancient uh, Middle Eastern world. Uh, up to that point in time, the church was centered in Asia Minor. Uh, and so as the, as the early apostles and missionaries started moving around, they used what was then known uh, to everybody, and that is the language of Greek. And so when they started writing up the stories of the, the early church, as well as the Gospels, and writing to churches, they used the language that was commonly known uh, to everybody. But why was there a need for the, a New Testament, uh, as it were? The early church used the same scriptures as we saw before. They, they only knew what we know today as the Old Testament. That, that was the scriptures. And so even in the New Testament, it is often referred to as the scriptures. Um, and, and that was what they referred to um, and used, and that was the Old Testament. 
But with the planting of churches and with the spreading of the gospel, there was a growing need over time to know more about God, about Jesus Christ and, and how He came into this world and, and what He meant and, and how we need to relate to one another as Christians. And more specifically, when the gospel started crossing the cultural barriers into other parts of the world, uh, into the non-Jewish worlds. Those people needed guidance. The, those people didn't grow up with the law, the, the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Um, many of them were aware of it, but they certainly didn't grow up with that. And so many of them didn't necessarily study the Old Testament, especially when they became Christian. And so typically someone like Paul, when he planted a church in, let's say, uh, Thessalonica, he wrote to the church in Thessalonica two letters that we have in our New Testament to help them, to give them guidance, to tell them how they should live and what they should do um, in terms of being Christian. And so those letters uh, became very popular very soon. And uh, of course, over time, the, the letters expanded up to about 13 of those uh, that, that Paul eventually wrote. But at the same time, the realization started that those apostles who were with Jesus and were the first witnesses, the first eyewitnesses, and heard him speak, and they told and retold the story of Jesus, it pretty soon became clear that those people started dying and, and that Jesus wasn't coming back. There was an initial expectation that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. But as some of the apostles started dying, the realization crept in We've got to write this down unless we start losing it because purely relying on oral tradition, as good as it was, it is, not e it is easier to change oral tradition than actually writing it down. And some people, I mean, just honestly needed some written material so they can read the stories of Jesus. The stories of Jesus were available. Um, they were available in collected stories probably. Uh, as far as we can determine now, maybe there was a collection of the miracles of Jesus, the collection of the parables that he told, some, some uh, uh, collection about his last days, like the crucifixion and the resurrection and so forth. And then we have uh, the books like Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and, and those actually sat down and they made it, and Luke actually tells us that's exactly what he did. He said, I did research, I used other documents, and I put together in an orderly form uh, the story of Jesus so that you can know how to follow. So that, that, that's how probably the Gospels came into existence. Uh, to that was added the book of, of Revelation uh, ultimately. Paul's letters, as far as we know, probably uh, were the first ones. In fact, it's either, in my personal opinion, James, the book of James, the letter of James, or First Thessalonians. Uh, either of those two could, could have been the first letters written, the first New Testament documents written. Pretty soon after that, the Gospels were written, and, and uh, uh, during that same time, some of the letters were added, obviously, over time. The last one was by the mid-90s. Uh, uh, John, we know, uh, according to tradition, wrote uh, the book of Revelation. In addition to the Old Testament, these writings provided the early church with their scriptures, and soon um, they became authenticated and they became accepted as the Word of God. So the need for a New Testament canon also developed over time. Um, obviously, there was a need for written New Testament documents. And, and I, I, I just suggest that this is probably the process that was followed at the particular time. But there were certain things that prompted the early church to sit down, not, again, in one single meeting, not, not at all, but over time to discuss and debate the issue of which of the books are actually authentic documents that we should believe this is God speaking to us. This is God's Word. Because now, many other documents started seeing the light. Uh, we have evidence of an early letter that was written in the 90s already by Clement. Uh, um, and, and so we have all of these things coming to light. And then into the 2nd and 3rd centuries, loads and loads of other books were written or documents saw the light. All sorts of different things. Um, you will find it almost humorous when you look at the titles of some of these. Acts of Peter, Acts of Paul, Acts of Thomas, um, the Gospel of Thomas, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Uh, there's an endless list of different documents that were written during that same time. So the church in a certain sense, over a, a few hundred years, was overwhelmed, bombarded by different books and documents written. And so the question arose, which of these documents 
should we accept as valid. Now, the need for a New Testament canon arose out of, number one, the, the, the realization or the, the fact that the Old Testament was actually an accepted, uh, authentic book. So by now, the Christians also, like the Jews, came to treasure scriptures. They, they already had the Old Testament, and they valued that as God's word. And as they started seeing the, the, the Christian church expand and develop, they started realizing, but, but the Christian church also needs a, a volume of documents that, that we can regard as God's word to us. The church needed guidance in, in matters of faith. Uh, you can imagine, and in fact, even within the New Testament, we already find the false doctrines creeping in. And so false doctrines were uh, multiplying like crazy. And if they only relied on the oral tradition, it's like uh, playing uh, telephone, telephone. You know, if I whisper in the first ear and then the second ear and the third ear, and it goes on, you don't know what the story is going to be at the end uh, at, of that line. And, and a similar danger was there with the church. They needed that guidance. The other thing was the time lapse between the ascension of Jesus and his real life on earth and the church over time, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years later. Now, of course, the story will, will become old and you don't know how the story may be changed. So there is a need for a New Testament canon. And then also, as I said before, the realization that the apostles providing the authentic oral tradition were not going to live forever. <coughs> And then Jesus' return was not as imminent as they initially thought, and they knew they needed to put this down in writing. And then the wide geographical spread of the early church, right around the known ancient world, uh, all the way from, from Europe to Asia Minor to Palestine, um, and down into Egypt um, and North Africa, and all the way going to the east at that time. And so um, the, the church realized that they, they needed to provide some... Uh, uh, source, some docu document uh, source, so that the church can follow that. And then, of course, uh, one of the major stimulants for a New Testament canon came from a negative angle, and that is false doctrines. Um, and one of the examples of that uh, is a man by the name of Marcion, who put together his own canon and chucked out, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, but he chucked out most of the, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament and so on and only held on to a few. And the church actually responded to that by saying, how far are we going to allow this to go? Uh, we, should be, uh, we should be doing something about that. But there are early indications of what one can call New Testament canon, if you wish. Some authors, such as Paul, claim to, to speak and write with authority. Uh, John and others, uh, even in John's letter, first letter, he says, we were eyewitnesses, we heard, we touched, we felt, we, we were there. And so he speaks with authority. And he's, he's claiming that his words, the words that, he, that he's writing, uh, are words of, uh, with that, that hold God's authority, and therefore uh, people should be listening to him. In Second Peter, we even have a reference to some of the works of the Apostle Paul. I don't know whether you, you've ever read that. Uh, uh, before, but uh, it's a very interesting reference that we find where, where Peter uh, refers to uh, Paul's writings. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Um, I'll start with 14. He says, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, the new earth and so on, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all these letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. We still say that today. Uh, which ignorant and unstable people distort. That's a reference to false teachings. As they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, the interesting thing is that, that Peter here, in one sentence, equates other scriptures, probably referring to the Old Testament, and Paul's letters with one another. It's almost putting them on the same plane. And today we do, because we believe both contain the scripture or the, the words of God. And there are references in the, um, in the early church father, and, and some of the, by the, some of the early church fathers, uh, in the second century where we definitely have references to some of the New Testament scriptures, such as Clement. Um, I referred to him already. 
uh, he seems to be referring in his letter that he wrote about 90 AD already to the gospel, so they were in existence at the time. There is Ignatius of Antioch and 115 AD who is familiar with the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew. There is Polycarp of Smyrna who lived 115 to 135, and he quotes both Mark and Matthew uh, in his reference. So in the early 2nd century already, we have references to some of the books as we have in Second Peter to uh, that of Paul. But the interesting thing is that the early church fathers, the early church leaders also used and quoted the Apocrypha at the time. In fact, it took the early church fathers longer to come to a point of drawing the line in terms of Old Testament canon than it took the Jews. By, by the time of Jesus, the Jews virtually only held to the 24 books in their scriptures or the 39 that we have. But the early church fathers went a long while longer uh, in determining the Old Testament for them. So the situation was fluid at the time. And when we go into the history, uh, as I said, one of the major stimulants came from a negative angle, and that is from uh, the views held by Marcion. Marcion was born in 100 AD uh, in Sinope in Asia Minor and became an active and influential Christian. And he was a, a popular teacher by 150 um, AD already in the second, halfway through the second century. But his teachings included the following. He said, and he firmly believed, and it was a teaching that, that, that spread at the time, that there were two gods. One in the Old Testament, it was a God of judgment, and there was another God in the New Testament. That's a loving God. That's Jesus. And he therefore rejected the Old Testament altogether. He said, we shouldn't take the Old Testament. That's a different story altogether. We, don't, we shouldn't believe it. He said it was ritualistic, it was legalistic, it was judgmental, and we shouldn't accept it. And then Paul, he said, is the only one who really, really understood the gospel. And therefore, we should go for Paul. He therefore rejected Matthew, and he chucked out John because it was too Jewish for him. And uh, Mark, he didn't, he didn't follow. He kept parts of the gospel of Luke, something that resembles Luke. And it was only one single gospel, and then the letters of Paul, the rest he chucked out. And that was his canon, if you wish. And he started teaching and preaching that with some influence. So you can see that's relatively early in, uh, in Christian history. The church, therefore, responded to that. There's lots of debate around that um, among church leaders. And as they, as they tackled and opposed uh, Marcion, um, his teachings and the limited canon that he published and taught highlighted the need for a body of authoritative New Testament scriptures to come to a point where the church reaches consensus to say these are the scriptures. And then during the following 150 years, uh, again I have to disappoint you, there is no one single date, although I will give you a couple of dates in a moment, but from about 150 to 200 there were lots of different debates around this and people started publishing, if you were, or making known New Testament canons, and most of those early versions uh, resembled um, most of what we have in the New Testament uh, today. But it took a, a, a long time longer, another hundred years or so, before the matter was finally uh, sort of settled. Some of the examples of early New Testament canons included the Muratorian canon. It was named after a person by the name of Muratori. Uh, dates from about 170 to 210 A.D., and it's roughly 80% in agreement with what we have today in our New Testament. By 250 AD, the New Testament canons that were produced, and there's several of them, and we don't have time, and I don't have the skills to go into all of the history uh, over there, but uh, the one that was, or those canons that were in circulation, uh, were virtually the same as our New Testament canon. And that can be seen, by example, from Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen, um, early church fathers who had a canon that resembled our New Testament canon today. There's still some disagreement similar to that of the Old Testament uh, when it came to Song of Songs and Esther and others. In the New Testament, Peter, especially Second Peter, uh, raised a lot of debate. The book of Hebrews, because the author is unknown, and then the book of Revelation, because of the apocalyptic nature of the book of Revelation. So there were debates around that. And then, of course, several extra-biblical books were also quite heavily debated by the, uh, by the early church fathers as well. Now, by the late 4th century, by the end of the 300s, in other words, 
the canon known to us today was all but settled. And there were two by now, and I don't have time to go into the church history, but by now there were two major Christian movements, the Eastern movement and the Western movement, uh, or, or traditions. In the Eastern church tradition, there was Athanasius in 367 who published the canon as we know it today. In the Western church, the Council of Carthage in 397 reached the exact same consensus. So those two Christian traditions reached the consensus or the understanding that the 27 books that we have in our New Testament today is what should be there. From then on, it became the status quo, with only limited debate among church leaders from time to time. The matter was just about settled for all these years, but because of the Roman Catholic tradition uh, and, and the domination of the Roman Catholic Church, and then the Protestant um, uh, movement under, started essentially by Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther raised the debate again around the book of James. It is, it is very uh, uh, clear that Martin Luther was heavily influenced by his discovery of justification by faith. And, and part of the problem is, for Martin Luther, was that in the book of Romans, which is the one that he used uh, and read and came to the conclusion that it is only by grace and, and by God's mercy that we are justified based on our faith in Jesus Christ. It's only on that basis that you ever can be saved, and not by your works, which was heavily promoted in his day and time, uh, that you can actually through certain payments and works and, and, and legalism that you can be saved. And Martin Luther came to the, con to the opposite conclusion uh, to that. When he read the book of James, James and Paul both used the exact same example of Abraham and Isaac. Paul says, you need to see that Abraham was justified because he believed in God. James says, don't you see that, that Abraham was justified because he acted by offering and sacrificing Isaac. It was by doing something that he was, that he was justified. Now, what Martin Luther did, probably did not understand is that the two are not in opposition to one another. They were just coming to the same story from different angles. And uh, that uh, James is saying, you cannot just say with your mouth that you are a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Then you live a, a, a sinful lifestyle. He says that doesn't work. Your life must prove that you have faith. Paul was coming in from a different angle. He says, you cannot live a good life and then say, well, God, you must accept me. You believe in God, and only on the basis of what Christ did for you can you be justified before God. They both were actually saying the same thing, but one was coming from the pre-justification angle, the other one was coming from a post-justification angle, and that's why Martin Luther raised the whole issue of James once again. In terms of New Testament cri uh, canon criteria, the early church used uh, several things to determine whether a book should be in the New Testament canon or not. First of all, apostolic authorship, or at least written under the influence of one of the apostles who lived with Jesus. And so when you go into the New Testament books, just about every single one of them can be proved to have been written either by an apostle, um, either one of the twelve, or an extension of the apostleship, like Paul was also an apostle, no doubt about that. Uh, when it comes to um, Mark, for example, he was not an apostle, but he had a close association with Peter, Luke had a very close association with Paul. Uh, Hebrews, well, the book itself needed to be looked at. Now, again, when I list the criteria um, in, in your notes as you look at that, it is not every single one of them, but the combination of these uh, criteria that was used to determine whether a book should be uh, in the New Testament or not. Whether a book was used and, and how it was used in the early church also determined that, which was fairly similar to the Old Testament canon, and ultimately looking for that consensus around the world to see whether a book, a New Testament book, was used by the church and accepted as authoritative by God. And then agreement with the widespread and accepted doctrine that was prevalent in the early church. Anything that, that went against the grain of the New Testament teaching would have been rejected, and, and that's why several of the pseudepigrapha books uh, didn't make it into the New Testament. The age of a book, of course, the older the book, 
the better the chance that it was authentic. If a book was written like 250 AD, the likelihood of that book really reflecting a true version of the gospel uh, was very unlikely. And then the signs of inspiration and authenticity, uh, avoiding the wild stories, but, but looking and reading the book and finding out from a church perspective whether this uh, uh, reveals some authenticity. And then the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We, both the Old and the New Testament, we cannot deny uh, the involvement of God Himself in this process. Not only in the writing and the inspiration of the authors who put together those different books, but also in the process of canonization. We have to acknowledge that God was behind all of this. And we believe that the Holy Spirit guided the early church in putting this all uh, together. The Apocrypha in Christian uh, literature... There are many, many extra canonical books that were written in the early centuries, as I said before. And I would encourage you to go maybe online or to buy a book about the Pseudepigrapha or New Testament Apocrypha. There are many different words or titles used for that. Um, from, from a New Testament perspective, we probably do not talk about New Testament Apocrypha. Most of them would fall into the category of Pseudepigrapha. They've been written in the name of another person. Um, like the experiences of Moses or whatever the case might be. Um, this went on for many years, but the most influential of these books uh, were written in the years 100 to 250 uh, AD. There is another dictionary that I have in my, in my office. It's called um, the Dictionary of the Later New Testament and its Developments. And there's a, a wonderful article in this dictionary where the, a description is given of the pseudepigrapha and the background and how they are found. I, I, I'm just going to give you some examples of that, and all of this information comes from that particular dictionary. It's listed in the back uh, of your notes as well. Some of the examples, apocalyptic and prophetic literature, they, they show some similarities to the book of, of Revelation, but they are more a continuation of Old Testament apocrypha and apocalyptic uh, material. Typical characteristics, there's a supernatural revealer, there's an angel, there's a revelation either by Jesus or by God or by an angel. Uh, the authorship is attributed to a well-known biblical figure. It's either Jeremiah or Moses or uh, Paul or someone else. And then some of the examples, the apocalypse of Peter, uh, it came close in church history to being accepted. The ascension of Isaiah the Apocalypse of Thomas, here is just scratching the surface of the number or the samples of books available uh, in the uh, Pseudepigrapha. The Apostolic Acts, <clears throat> again I can tell you there are plenty, there, there, there's plenty, the, the, the number of these books uh, available. And they can be defined as, according to the dictionary, as a narrative of the missionary activity of a single apostle, concluding with martyrdom, most of them conclude with some kind of a horrific killing uh, of that apostle. Some of the earliest and most known examples include the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of John, the Acts of Paul, the Acts of Peter, the Acts of Thomas, uh, and so forth. There are other varieties. There are apostolic pseudepigrapha, the preaching of Peter, the second apocalypse of James. There's wisdom literature, the teachings of Silvanus. There is hymnic literature, such as the Odes of Solomon, uh, and it goes on and on and on. Let me just give you a couple of examples. The first one is the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and on the back of the screen, you'll actually have uh, a picture of, the, uh, of, of a sample of a page from the, the Gospel of Thomas. And this is more or less what Greek uh, was written like in those days. Uh, you really need to be a well-trained Greek scholar to de decipher some of that. Um, this, this book contains collection of, collections of 114 Secret sayings. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon. So many of the pseudepigrapha and even some of the apocrypha uh, include some secret message. This is something that someone mentioned secretly, and I have now come to make it known to you. Uh, and it's written down secretly so that no, nobody uh, will discover that. And it dates from about 200 AD, and these are the secret sayings of Jesus. Uh, here is a quote from sacredtext.com. The Gospel of Thomas is a collection of traditional sayings or logoi sayings, uh, words of Jesus. It is attributed to Didymus Judas Thomas, the doubting Thomas of the canonical Gospels, and according to many early traditions, the twin brother of Jesus. 
We have two versions of the Gospel of Thomas today. The first was discovered in the late 1800s among the Oxyrhynchus papyri and, the, and consists of fragments of a Greek version which has been dated to about 200 AD. The second is a complete version in Coptic, Egypt, Egyptian Coptic from Codex II of the Nakh Hammadi finds. Thomas was probably first written in Greek or possibly even Syriac or Aramaic related languages uh, not to Greek but to, to Hebrew and, and it's sometime in the mid first to the second centuries and, and here is the assessment of that Gospel of Thomas although it's not possible to attribute the Gospel of Thomas to any particular sect it is clearly Gnostic in nature and uh, you, know, you need to know m more about the Gnostic movement uh, it was based on a system of knowledge which is where the word comes from no Gnosis in Greek and so through knowing more and more, you, you are elevated and you go through ranks of knowledge until you become equal to God, something to that nature. As the preamble indicates, uh, these are secret sayings. They are intended to be es esoteric in nature. The sayings are not intended to be interpreted literally, as the New Testament parallels often are, but to be interpreted symbolically as attested by saying number one. While a liberal, literal interpretation may make sense, only by understanding the deeper meanings of the sayings can one really truly understand them. So it's secret, it's deep, it's, uh, it's someone who has this knowledge and is now making them known, and uh, it clearly falls into the category of extra-biblical literature. Here is, a, here is a fascinating example, and it's called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And uh, just today I've read some of the extracts from uh, this gospel once again. And I found some very, very interesting little stories. But let me read what F.F. F. Bruce is saying in Jesus and Christian Origins outside the New Testament. He says, The infancy gospel of Thomas purports to describe the doings of Jesus in his boyhood. Now, this is another interesting phenomenon. The moment the Bible is uh, lacking information on something or is mysterious about something, so, uh, by, by way of example, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is mentioned in the Old Testament. He's a priest. He's a priest of the city of peace or something like that. And that's all the information we have. And Abram pays tithes to Melchizedek. It's all the Bible ever says. Now, would you believe, in fact, you should believe, that some people then designed stories around Melchizedek because there's no more information. In fact, you cannot prove anything more about him. It's completely unknown. And so, the same thing happens now with Jesus. Jesus is mentioned in the Bible in terms of his birth. One or two incidents from his childhood. And then the next thing, Jesus is 30 years old and he's on the scene and he's ministering. And so, the obvious question is, what happened during his childhood? And books are written, documents see the light, to tell us what happened about Jesus in those times. But they're unauthentic. They simply are um, imaginations and stories that people make up. And here you have a very, very good example of that. Jesus proves to be an infant prodigy at school, instructing his teachers in the unsuspected mysteries of the alphabet. Um, just today I read that story from this particular gospel in a translation. And it says... Uh, there was, a, there was a, a leader by the name of Zacchaeus and he came and spoke uh, to Joseph, his, his father, and said, I would be willing to take your son, Jesus, and, and take him to my school and school him in the alphabet. And then Jesus responded, he was only a boy, but he responded and he started expounding the letter, the first letter of the alphabet, telling, telling Zacchaeus about how the letter was formed and the meaning of the letter and everything else. This is the Gospel of Thomas. There's another story in there. In fact, uh, Bruce refers to that as well. Jesus is playing by the, uh, by the river or the stream or something with other children, and it's on the Sabbath. And he, 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 he uh, collects some water uh, into little puddles or whatever, uh, and, and then he makes, out of clay, he makes some, some birds, 12 of them, I think. And then an adult comes along, and he sees what is happening. He goes to Joseph, his father. He says, your... Uh, son is, is doing something he's not supposed to do on the Sabbath. He, he is uh, working on the Sabbath. So they all go down to the little stream and they find Jesus there and Jesus blows on them and suddenly those clay birds fly away. They become live birds. So again, it's a story that cannot be authenticated 
it is uh, happening in the life of Jesus at the age of whatever, five. Now, where we stand today, we believe that the Holy Spirit guided the process, as I said to you before. I, I firmly stand on that, and I believe that God, through His Holy Spirit, guided both Old Testament and New Testament canons. There is general consensus among scholars and leaders around the world, in, in the church and in Jewish, as far as, as the Old Testament is concerned, that these books should be in, our, uh, in the Bible and that they comprise the Word of God for us. The Apocrypha are valuable. Uh, you can read them. They're not secret. Nobody is holding them away from you or keeping them away from you. They're there for you to read. Um, you can do that. There's value in doing that, but they're not authentic. They're not inspired Word of God. And we praise God for His revelation of Himself. The Westminster Confession of Faith has something to say about that, and I'm not going to even quote that, uh, but it says um, that the, the, essentially that these 66 books is what we accept as the inspired uh, Word of God. Now, between uh, tonight and next week, I do encourage you to go over your notes again and, and do some additional reading. And if you are registered for the Certificate of Completion, you have to do some extra reading. And ultimately, uh, you're going to submit a one or two page document or a report where you simply list what you have read and make a few comments about that. I'm not, I'm not expecting a research assignment, but I do want you just to, um, to give proof of the fact that you have done some additional reading. And then uh, for next week, I ask you to memorize the first 22 uh, books, the names of the first 22 books in the Bible, from Genesis uh, to the Song of Songs. And then next week, we'll look at the background of Israel, the background of the Bible, really. And we'll look at the history of Israel, uh, starting especially with the call of Abraham, and then going right through the history of Israel to uh, the return from the exile. Then we'll skip over the intertestamental period, and uh, we'll look at the New Testament history, the, the first hundred years or so of Christianity. Um, and then the week after that, we'll come back to the intertestamental period and look at that history. And I'll see you next time. May the Lord bless you. Thank you.